So it began the end of this summer when I was talking with Andrew about solitude. I was telling him that I was very excited about the upcoming series on solitude. You see, for me, solitude is a discipline that I cherish. And it started many, many years ago. I grew up in northern Ontario on 100 acres of bush. So that meant as a child, my mom would send me out to play in the forest. I would walk amongst the trees, play in the ponds, catch frogs, snakes, salamanders, etc. It was actually a wonderful way to grow up. I was also raised with a God that is relational. When I was three, I spent a year with my grandmother figure. Her name was Annie John. And my house was being built, so we were living with her, and I would get up every morning, and I would crawl into bed with her. And I'd ask her to tell me a story. So she would read for me the story of the shepherd leaving the 99 in search of the one. And what that taught me as a three-year-old child is that God was interested in me. He was interested in my thoughts, my hurts, my worries, my dreams, me. So it was natural for me to walk in the cool forest, sunlight streaming through the leaves, dappling the floor, and talk with God. Sometimes the conversations were one-sided, and I would do the lion's share of the talking. And other times, I would simply walk, and I would listen. I've come to realize that this upbringing, and I would venture my view on God, is somewhat unique, just like each and every one of you here are beautifully unique. Emily P. Freeman, in her book, How to Walk into a Room, references the nine most common ways we experience and connect with God. And depending on our unique wirings, personalities, we will resonate with one or more of these ways. They include the naturalist, so as I've just described, those of us who love being with God in nature. So forests, oceans, and God's created world, we feel most present with God. They're the sensates, those of us that connect with God through our senses. So the sense of incense, beautiful music, the smell of fresh bread connects us most to God. There are the traditionalists, those of us who are drawn to liturgy and ritual and the rich historical dimensions of our faith. There are the ascetics, those of us who connect with God through meditation, silence, and solitude. I imagine the last few weeks were good for you guys. The activists, those of us who connect with God by working with him to confront corrupt systems and stand with the marginalized. The caregivers, those of us who sense God when we are caring for those he has put in our lives. The enthusiasts, those of us who connect with God through joyful celebration, worship, music, mystery. The contemplatives, those of us who connect with God through a rich inner prayer life and contemplation. And finally, last but not least, the intellectuals, those of us who connect with God by reading his word or a good book on theology. I'm excited to be here today to share with you what God has put on my heart. And while I wear many hats in my day-to-day -day life, I'll be honest, this is the first time today that I have spoken in front of a church. I do speak semi-regularly as I am an adjunct professor at the Atlantic Veterinary College in Prince Edward Island. And for me, in this list, I can see myself connecting with God in many of these ways. But most commonly, I would say I'm a naturalist and an intellectual with a contemplative and activist bent. I think that understanding how we connect with God and how we experience him can often be a gateway to understanding how to practice solitude. If we define solitude as intentionally setting aside time to connect with and make space for God, to seek intimacy with the divine, to leave space for God to speak and work, would it not make sense that God would meet us in the places he has wired us to love? This doesn't mean he only meets us in those spaces, but I would venture, if you are struggling with solitude, that is where I would start. For me, if I am struggling to connect with God, to find the calm center where I can listen to and hear God, 
I will go into nature. In October, I was working in PEI for two weeks. And so when I am there, my weeks are rather full. They're often 12 plus hour days. So the weekends, I've got some time to myself. One of the draws for me to working in PEI is the ocean. So the ocean with its beauty, its majesty and various moods is special to me. It is a thin place and God will often meet me there. So because of this, typically when I'm there, I will plan what I call a beach walk. So I pick one of the many beaches, it's not hard with PEI, it's mostly beaches, that is kilometers and kilometers long, so that I can walk and be present with God. Now October is very cold <laughs> in PEI. And so I picked a time to go and do a beach walk the one day that it wasn't raining. But the forecast still was for 60 kilometer an hour winds. Now, having not grown up on the East Coast, I didn't really have a point of reference for what that would be like. And if you've been to PEI, the beaches have dunes, most of them, that you have to climb up over to get onto the beach. And this is actually a picture of the beach that I walked on that day. So I began my journey up over the sand dune, and when I reached the top, I was almost literally blown back down. I stood there, holding my own against the wind, knowing I had to make a decision. I came to connect with God, that this was not going to be the beach walk I had in mind. Um, it was cold, it was windy, and as you can see, there was very few other people on the beach. Did I want to brave this wind and this cold? Was it worth it? So I came to the decision that walking in relationship with someone is not always easy. And perhaps this beach walk in the driving wind was a physical manifestation of that fact. So cautiously and slowly, I plodded forward and walked along the beach. The walk was physically taxing. I had to actually lean in to the wind to walk. It was cold. The rhythmic sound of the waves crashing on the beach was both musical and calming. The experience was what I would call cleansing. I could feel the presence of God as I walked, hunched over, pushing into the wind. And the return walk was quite a bit of fun. The wind was at my back and it felt like I was a kite. I could physically lean into the wind, almost like leaning into God. The natural world, the driving wind, the crashing waves created space for me to connect with the divine. God spoke to me on this walk about perseverance, determination, grief, presence, love, and hope. The Bible is replete with stories of God connecting with people. We could talk about the common ones, or the most obvious ones, I guess you could say. Adam, Eve, Abraham, Mary, Paul, etc. So why does this matter? Why does God want to connect with us? When we choose to practice solitude and seek connection, what is the result? One story that helps to answer this question is the story of Hagar. Hagar's story is found in Genesis 16, 1 to 15, and 22, 8 to 21. It is a difficult but beautiful story. Hagar's story is found intertwined with the story of Abram and Sarai. You see, Hagar was Sarai's Egyptian slave. She would have likely been gifted or purchased to them when they left Egypt. She would have been much younger than Sarai, who would have been about in her 70s to 90s in this part of the story. And she would have spent the vast majority of her time taking care of Sarai and her needs. Many slaves at that time were purchased very young, and this is thought to be the case for Hagar. And so she would have grown up under Sarai's care through puberty and into womanhood. So in case you're not familiar with Abram and Sarai's story, it begins in Genesis 12, where God calls Abram from his native country to go to the land God has chosen for him. He promises that he will make him into a great nation and will bless him. In this process, a famine occurs, and Abram and Sarai are detoured to Egypt, which is likely where they acquire Hagar. But eventually, they settle in the land of Canaan. And in Genesis 15, Abram receives a promise from God that he will, receive, that he will have a son, 
and that he will have more descendants than there are stars in the sky. However, Abram and Sarah were old, and 10 years passed, and still there was no son. So Sarai, knowing that the promises, at least at this point in time, had made to Ab been made to Abram, took matters into her own hands, and she gave Hagar to Abram as a surrogate with the hopes of producing an heir. If we pause for a minute and ponder what it might have been like for Hagar, I can imagine she would have felt betrayed. She was purchased as a maidservant, not a concubine. However, as property, she really did not have a choice in the matter. And as a side note, I am calling Hagar a surrogate out of respect. The translators of the Hebrew Bible translate Genesis 16:3 to say, Sarai took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. However, the word translated here as wife is the Hebrew word Isha. Isha can be translated as woman, female, wife, adulteress, harlot, widow, girl, etc. The translation to wife in this case is the translator's interpretation. When we read the Bible, we bring with us an understanding of what words mean. Based on our experiences, our cultural context, and place in history. For example, we would come today with the understanding of what a wife actually is. Therefore, there is danger when a word such as isha is translated as wife, that we will use this story as an example of the relationship between a husband and a wife. Or worse, that we will use it as a defense when things go wrong. Hagar's purpose in this transaction was to produce a son. This required her to be a woman. Therefore, I feel Isha is better translated as woman. Hagar's story is one about a fulfillment of a promise, not a narrative about a husband and a wife. As you will see in the next interaction, Abram did not regard Hagar as a wife, at least not as we would see one today. Hagar conceives, and understandably, there is discord that arises between Sarai and Hagar. So Sarai approaches Abram about this discord, and Abram simply responds, your slave is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. For Sarai, this meant treating Hagar so badly that she fled. So Hagar, alone, pregnant, with no status, supplies, flees into the wilderness, into the desert. She would not have been dumb. She would have known that this choice likely would have meant death. We're going to pick her story up in Genesis 16, 7 to 13, and they'll be on the slides. The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. He said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man his hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility towards all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Lahai Roy. It is still there between Kadesh and Mered. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Hagar runs into solitude. Some scholars would even suggest this means to darkness or to obvious death in the desert. However, she is seen and found there by God. In her story, I see a God who is relational, a God who wants to connect, 
and a God that transforms. A God that is relational. The question the angel of the Lord asks Hagar show us that they have interest in who she is. Where have you come from, Hagar? Here they are asking about her story, her history, her pain, her experiences, all of the things that make her Hagar. As a slave, this may have been the first time anyone had cared or asked about her. Hagar, where are you going? Here, the angel of the Lord is asking about her hopes, her dreams, her worries, and where she was fleeing to. God wants relationship with Hagar, and God wants relationship with us. Our God is, in essence, relational. He's described as a trinity, three in one. I've heard a beautiful and fitting description of the trinity as a dance between the three godheads involving a mutual outpouring of love. And the incredible mystery is that the spirit, part of this trinity, resides in us. We are invited into this loving dance with our relational God. So when we seek God in solitude, when we, we get to play a role in this dance, to be part of this relationship, God wants to connect. In verse 7, it says that the angel of the Lord found Hagar. He was looking for her, just like he looks for that lost sheep. And when Hagar connects with God, he sees her for who, not as the world sees her, property, discarded, abused, pregnant, slave. He sees her as valuable, a child of God, with a future, beloved. He sees her for who she is. He acknowledges her pain, sees her misery, and tells her that she is carrying a son and gives her the same promise that was given to Abram. Think about that. Verse 10. I will increase your descendants so much so that they will be too numerous to count. Incredibly, Hagar in response names God. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. From a runaway slave to a woman who names God, and in case you didn't know, Hagar is the only one in the Hebrew Bible who names God. She is also the first person in the Bible to have been visited by an angel of the Lord. This very act of naming God speaks to my next point. God transforms. In times of solitude, God can transform us. Hagar begins the story as a slave used by her master, masters as a surrogate for their own means. And while God sends her back into this situation, she returns knowing she is loved, seen, and that she carries in her belly the beginning of a nation. God gave Hagar a future worth living for. Ishmael, her son, goes on to have 12 sons, which in turn become the Arab nations that we know today. Did Hagar's situation change when she returned to Sarai's camp? I don't imagine they did. However, what was changed was Hagar. I will as an aside mention that the years down the road, Hagar is freed through various circumstances from Abraham and Sarah, as they would be known then. This is the Genesis 22 portion of the story. The road was not easy for Hagar, but God was faithful to his promise. And I imagine that Hagar was not alone in the years she, set, she spent in their camp. After encountering God and naming him, how could you not seek to connect again and again? When we spend time in the presence of our relational God who wants to connect with us, we cannot help but be transformed. In this time, God shows us who we are, his beloved child, and will transform us so that we can live out our lives in his strength. Are you leaving space in your day and in your weeks to connect with God? How is God transforming you? Here are some practical ways this week that you can leave space for God. Perhaps it is as simple as taking five minutes to pause in your day, to stop, to breathe, 
and to listen for God. Or perhaps it is a 15-minute walk, if you can, with no music, no ear pods, in the woods, on a trail, and ask God, is there anything you want to show me? How are you transforming me? And simply listen. And when your mind wanders, come back to that question. Or perhaps it is a 30-minute segment of silence, using a breath prayer to center and listen for God. Or perhaps it's all of the above for the next week, even the next month. I want to encourage you to make time for solitude. Learn to make it part of your rhythm of life. For me, what that looks like practically is that I drive a fair amount for work, so I may be on an hour, an hour and a half drive, and I will begin the time praying about whoever comes to mind or whatever situation I'm facing that day. But inevitably, there comes a time that I know in my soul that it is time for silence, so I simply stop talking and I listen. Sometimes God speaks. More often, I simply feel the presence of God along with me, knowing that I'm loved and seen and that God has a plan for me in this one beautiful life I have been given. We're going to close with a prayer that I feel is about transformation. Breathe restlessness into me. Thank you for all I forget are gifts, not rights. Forgive me for all the grievances I remember too well. Save me from the self-pity, the self-seeking, the fat-heartedness, which is true poverty. Guide me if I'm willing, drive me if I'm not, into the hard ways of sacrifice, which are just and loving. Make me wide-eyed for beauty and for my neighbor's need and goodness. Wide-willed for peacemaking and for the confronting power with the call to compassion. Wide-hearted for love and for the unloved who are the hardest to touch but need it most. Dull the envy in me which criticizes and complains life into a thousand ugly bits. Keep me honest and tender enough to heal. Tough enough to be healed by my, of my hypocr hypocrisies. Match my appetite for privilege with the stomach for commitment. Teach me the great cost of paying attention that naked to the dazzle of your back as you pass, I may know I am always on holy ground. Breathe into me the restlessness and courage to make something new, something saving, and something true, that I may understand what it is to rejoice. Amen. <laughs>